Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Butterfield, the Executive Director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington and Mount Vernon. I'm coming to you from the vault at the Washington Library uh, for an exciting moment, uh, the announcement of the winner of this year's George Washington Prize. The George Washington Prize is an important part of the mission of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, which isn't simply about historic preservation. It's also about making serious, important, and accessible scholarship available to the world so that people can better understand our founding era and George Washington's role in the creation of modern America. It's an important part of our mission and we're thrilled to have another opportunity to welcome another winner of this year's prize into the pantheon of, of celebrants. This is a great opportunity. Thank you so much for joining us. Soon we'll have an opportunity to meet this year's winner, uh, one of the most accomplished and important historians working today. Adam Goodhart, the director of the CV Star Center for the Study of the American Experience at Washington College, is now going to join us to tell, a, tell us a bit more about the history of this prize and the partners who helped make it up. Adam? Thanks so much, Kevin. The Washington Prize was launched in 2005 by our institution, the Star Center at Washington College, and also the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History and George Washington's Mount Vernon. The prize honors each year's best works on early American history, and especially those that have the potential to advance broad understanding of the past. And it comes with a check for $50,000, which makes it one of the nation's largest literary awards. Our past winners have included the likes of Ron Chernow, Lin-Manuel Miranda, Annette Gordon-Reed, and Nathaniel Philbrick, some of the most exciting and dynamic people at work in the field of history today. The seven finalists this year were selected by a jury of distinguished historians, and then the winner was chosen by a committee of scholars and institutional leaders. The Star Center at Washington College is especially pleased to co-sponsor this award because of our larger mission, which is to make American history more accessible and relevant to broadly interested readers, not just academic audiences. We do that through writing fellowships, through innovative public history programs, and a wide array of opportunities for Washington College students in every field. Right now, our work, including the Washington Prize, feels more necessary than it ever has before. At this troubled moment in America, and with historical questions at the center of so many of our public debates, examining the period of our nation's founding can yield fresh and powerful insights into our own time. This year's winning book is an exquisite masterpiece of history by one of the nation's foremost writers and historians. There's a newness, an eloquence, and an immediacy in his narrative. It conveys to the reader a sense of discovering the American Revolution for the very first time in all of its drama. This volume embraces the lived experience of that dramatic era with its complexities, ironies, triumphs, and tragedies. Now we're going to hear from students all over the country involved with the Gilder Lehrman Institute, which is the leading American history nonprofit dedicated to K through 12 education. Those young people will announce the names of this year's seven finalists before one of our own students from Washington College presents the award to the winner.
Hello, my name is Flavia Nunez. I am a student on the Gilder Lerman National Student Advisory Council and a junior at School for Advanced Studies in Miami, Florida. The first finalist for the 2020 George Washington Book Prize is Rick Atkinson for The British Are Coming, The War for America, Lexington to Princeton, 1775 to 1777, published by Henry Holt and Company. Hi, my name is Annabelle Krauss, and I'm a senior at the Bronxville High School, a Gilder Lehrman affiliate school in Bronxville, New York. I'm also a member of the Gilder Lehrman National Student Advisory Council. The second finalist for the 2020 George Washington Book Prize is Richard Bell for his book, Stolen, Five Free Boys Kidnapped into Slavery and Their Astonishing Odyssey Home, published by 37 Inc. Hello. My name is Drew Runta, and I'm a junior at John P. Stevens High School in Edison, New Jersey, and a student on the Gilder Lehrman National Student Advisory Council. I'm here to present the third finalist for the 2020 George Washington Post, Matthew R. Costello, for his book, The Property of the Nation, George Washington's Tomb, Mount Vernon, and the Memory of the First President, published by the University of Kansas Press. Hi there, my name is Marissa Hirschfield and I'm a sophomore at the Ethical Culture Fieldston School in New York City. I'm also a member of the National Student Advisory Council at the Gilder Lehrman Institute. The fourth finalist for the 2020 George Washington Book Prize is Douglas Edgerton, who wrote Heirs of an Honored Name, The Decline of the Adams Family and the Rise of Modern America, published by Basic Books. Hello, my name is Fauzia Islam. I'm in my first year at the City College of New York and a student on the Gilder Lerman National Student Advisory Council. The fifth finalist for the 2020 George Washington Prize, Richard Godbeer, for his book, World of Trouble, a Philadelphia Quaker family's journey through the American Revolution, published by the Yale University Press. Hello, my name is Sierra Trabasi, and I'm a member of the Gilder Lehrman National Student Advisory Council, as well as a senior at Moriarty High School in Moriarty, New Mexico. The sixth finalist for the 2020 George Washington Prize is David Head for A Crisis of Peace, George Washington, The Newburgh Conspiracy, and The Fate of the American Revolution, published by Pegasus Books. Hello. My name is Eliana Kelly, and I'm a senior at the Disney to Magna High School in Chicago, and I'm a member of the Gilder Learman National Student Advisory Council. The seventh finalist for the 2020 George Washington Prize is Martha Saxton for her book, The Widow Washington, The Life of Mary Washington, published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth Lilly and I'm a senior at Washington College majoring in philosophy and sociology. Thank you so much for welcoming me and joining us today. It is my great honor to announce the winner of this year's George Washington Prize, Rick Atkinson's The British Are Coming, The War for America, Lexington to Princeton, 1775 to 1777. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, and, and congratulations again to all of our seven finalists. Uh, what a, a remarkable group of books. It's now my great pleasure to bring Rick Atkinson into this virtual conversation. Rick, are you with us? Kevin, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I, 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 am, I am thrilled to have an opportunity to talk uh, with you. Uh, you're, as you know, but let me uh, tell for the sake of our audience, uh, an award-winning journalist and author, uh, well-known for your Liberation Trilogy, uh, World War II series, uh, the first volume of which won the Pulitzer Prize, and now you're embarking on a study of the Revolutionary War. Uh, this, The British Are Coming, is the first book of, a, of an expected trilogy. Thank you so much for joining us. Can I just ask you to start, um, why did you decide to write about the American Revolutionary War? 
Um, yeah, and thanks for having me, Kevin. And needless to say, thank you for this wonderful honor from uh, from uh, Gilder Lehrman uh, Institute and from Washington College, and of course from Mount Vernon. Uh, and thanks to those uh, wonderful students for the uh, the rundown of the finalists. Um, you know, when I finished writing about uh, World War II and the American role in the liberation of Europe in World War II, um, I'd spent 15 years on the subject, writing three volumes. Uh, it was 2013 when the third and final volume came out. And um, the obvious thing would have been to pivot to the Pacific and do for that theater what I'd done for the Mediterranean and, uh, and Western Europe. And I just didn't have the heart for it, frankly. Uh, and I've always had, uh, since childhood, a fascination with the American Revolution. I, I went to high school about five miles from where you're sitting right now at Mount Vernon in Northern Virginia. Uh, and I was just deeply imprinted with this uh, magnificent story of our, uh, our, our creation. Um, so being in a position where I could decide what I wanted to write about next, it seemed to me that uh, why not the, the, you know, if not the greatest story in the American narrative, certainly one of the top two or three. Uh, and finally, I had the theory that it was going to tell us something about who we have become, who we are in 2020, uh, by understanding what we went through uh, in the American Revolution, why we went through it. Um, and so th those were my fundamental reasons. I've been at it now for, for some years, uh, working on the second volume. Uh, and uh, I, I'm still uh, hopeful that uh, when I get through all of this, I'm going to have a much clearer sense of the people we have become. One of the great opportunities to, for our a prize announcement to be a part of the National Book Festival is to talk to you a little bit about the craft of writing and creating a book like this. Can I just ask you, when you decided to make the transition, what, what do you do first? How do you start to enter into the 18th century as a historian and as a writer? Yeah, well, first I start by acknowledging my ignorance. Uh, I know quite a bit about uh, World War II, particularly in Europe and Mediterranean. I was a journalist for many years, so journalists know a little bit about a lot of things. Uh, but I, I didn't, I'm not an expert on uh, the 18th century, the American Revolution, uh, when I start this project. So it requires uh, humility and uh, just plowing through incessantly, day after day, week after week, month after month, and now year after year, both primary and secondary sources. Secondary meaning the, the great books that have been written for more than 200 years now. And primary sources meaning everything from the papers of George Washington to very obscure uh, 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 papers of, from people most folks have never heard of. And that means going to archives, uh, Hither and yon, I spend a lot of time in London on this book, uh, outside of London at Kew, where the British National Archives are. Um, so that's how I start, trying to uh, throw my net into the sea and, and uh, in, a, in a, a fashion trawling whatever I can, uh, thinking about the story always as a story. Characters are critically important to what I do. Uh, narrative, uh, unspooling the story uh, in a way that uh, keeps you on the edge of your seat if I'm doing it well. Uh, even if you know how the American Revolution turns out, even if you know what happens uh, on April 19th, 1775 at Lexington and Concord, my ambition is to make it vivid and fresh, to bring characters in that you may not know fully, if at all, uh, and to have you believe as a reader that you are learning something for the first time. Well, you've accomplished that. Uh, I found it very difficult to, to put down, and even though I do know how it turns out, the, uh, the turn by turn is a little bit different, uh, and, and the, the opportunity to experience it uh, from that uh, moment by moment perspective uh, just jumps off the page. So thank you for doing that. Let me ask you if there is a moment, uh, you mentioned April 19th, uh, uh, but is there a, a particular moment in that, I think this, uh, this book covers about 21 months. Is there another moment that you found particularly vivid and exciting that uh, was entirely new to you? Uh, something that's uh, some turning point or moment that uh, just stands out in your memory of these early years of the war? 
Well, there are a lot of them, fortunately, uh, because the sense of discovery and the sense of the of excitement that comes with discovery uh, is one of the benefits of, of, of being an author. Um, you know, I write a lot about the British because my ambition was to tell the story from not only our side, but from their side. Uh, and so I, the book opens with uh, George III, uh, our last king, uh, in 1773, when he's going to Portsmouth for a review of the Royal Navy in the great naval base at Portsmouth. Um, it's like a national holiday in Britain. It's such a big event, and it's precisely 10 years after the creation of the first British Empire with the British victory over the French uh, in the French and Indian War, as we call it, the Seven Years' War, as they call it in Europe. Um, there are moments with George, including when he's headed to Portsmouth on that June day in 1773, that just remain electric to me, because this is the beginning, really, of... Um, his insistence and the insistence of the British government that uh, the, the recalcitrance of the Americans will not stand, that they will not be permitted to break away from the empire, that the empire is in danger of crumbling if that happens. Hmm. And then there are other moments on the battlefield, uh, the Battle of Valcour Island on Lake Champlain uh, in October 1776, where Benedict Arnold becomes a sailor and he knows how to sail, he knows how to build ships. The British are invading New York, headed for the Hudson Valley, headed for late, for Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, that one particular day in which uh, Arnold loses his little squadron, but manages to delay the British long enough so that their ambitions of, of moving uh, seriously into the Hudson Valley in 1776 are thwarted. Uh, it buys time. He trades space for time. And that's critically important. That, to me, is one of the most electric moments in American history. I say this as someone who's written extensively about the Battle of the Bulge, uh, the landings at Normandy, and all the rest connected to World War II. Uh, to me, that moment, Valcour Island, those few hours there are absolutely riveting. Outstanding, thank you. It, it's it's one of the, the episodes in in this book uh, that's filled with them. Uh, and I'm, I, you mentioned George the Third and and coming to to understand him a little better. You were one of the early researchers in the Georgian Papers program that took you into Windsor Castle. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your experiences working with the papers of, like you say, our last monarch? Uh, yeah, it was fantastic, uh, and I'm I'm really grateful to the Omahundra Institute uh, down at William and Mary. Uh, and to the folks at Windsor Castle and to the royal household. The queen decided in uh, late 2015, early 2016, that she was going to open up the, the Georgian papers, which she owns. And they're the papers of all four men named George who became king. Most of them belong to George III because he was king for 60 years. And as part of this opening up and digitizing of those papers, uh, they permitted uh, a limited number of scholars one at a time in for a month at a time. And I was one of the first uh, to, to take a look, uh, looking specifically at uh, the early uh, years of the revolution and just before the revolution began. So I lived in Windsor. The queen was there for the whole month. It was the month she turned 90. Uh, it was a wonderful, charming place. It's a real castle. Uh, and the papers are, are kept um, in the Round Tower, begun by William the Conqueror in the 11th century. And so every day I would show my badge at the Henry VIII gate and then show my badge again uh, at the Norman gate and, and up 102 stone steps and 21 wooden stairs to the garret of the Round Tower. And there are the papers. Uh, and the opportunity to, uh, George was his own secretary until late in life when he began to go blind. He wrote not only most of the correspondence himself, he, he, he made the copies himself. He was a great list maker. Um, and so these papers leap out at you with the force of his personality, um, his belief system, um, his ambitions for uh, the British Empire, uh, his relationship with the Queen, Charlotte, and, and uh, their 15 children. Uh, all of it's in the papers, and it gives you a real tactile sense of being in George's presence uh, more than 200 years after these things have actually been written. 
You mentioned a man named George, uh, and you mentioned a great list maker. There's another man named George who I, I come to learn as uh, here at the Washington Library was also a great list maker. Uh, I want to read uh, a little bit from your closing pages, uh, your reflections on George Washington, and have you talk a little bit about how you've come to understand George Washington through this research. Uh, th these are your words, and, I, and I, 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 I like them very much. It says, affliction revealed Washington's courage, durability, probity, and administrative skill. Since his appointment to lead the new army, he had developed a shrewd understanding of the refractory, independent peoples known collectively as Americans. A people unused to restraint must be led, he wrote in January 1777. They will not be drove. He was a leader. Talk to us about how you've come to understand George Washington, at least in these early months and years of the war. Yeah, that quote from him, that short quote, uh, people unused to restraint will not be uh, drove, they must be led, that really summarizes not only George Washington as a leader, but I think uh, the, the essence of every great leader, uh, certainly every great leader in a democracy. Um, you know, I had the privilege of living uh, uh, metaphorically with Dwight Eisenhower for 15 years when I wrote the Liberation Trilogy, and I came to admire him more and more during the course of those 15 years. And now I have the privilege of living with Washington as, as, as you and others at Mount Vernon do. And I, I feel the same way about him. The more I get to know him, the more I am permitted to study who he was, particularly as a general, and that's my focus, uh, the more I admire him, the more I uh, come to see that um, it's a cliche, but he is the indispensable man. If we don't have George Washington, we've got big problems during the revolution. We have big problems at the birth of the republic, needless to say. Um, you know, he has feet of clay, as we all do. He's an imperfect uh, uh, general. He's not a great natural field marshal. Eisenhower is the same. He does not see the battlefield spatially and temporally the way uh, uh, Napoleon does, for example. He makes mistakes. He makes a lot of mistakes. He's lucky to get away with some of them. Um, and when he arrives in Boston in early July of 1775 to take command of what will become the Continental Army, um, he's got a lot to learn. He's only been in uniform for five years as a Virginia militia colonel, and he's been away from that, out of uniform for 16, 17 years at that point. There's a lot that he does not know. There's a lot he doesn't know about artillery and cavalry and logistics, uh, about trying to run a continental army, uh, and watching him come to grips with that and, and learn from his mistakes and acknowledge his defects and identify those who can help him. Improbable uh, soldiers like Nathaniel Green, Quaker anchor smith from Rhode Island, Henry Knox, an overweight Boston bookseller, 25 years old, he'll become the father of American artillery. Um, these things are extraordinary. As someone who's spent a political, a, a, uh, my entire professional life writing about uh, men and now men and women at arms, writing about war, seeing Washington come to it and grapple with it and succeed and fail and succeed and learning from his failures is really extraordinary. Uh, and he, you know, our reverence for him is not misplaced. Yes, when he dies, where you, where you are, Mount Vernon, in 1799, he's got 300 slaves. You cannot square that circle morally. He kind of knows that. Uh, but that said, uh, he's still a, an extraordinary man who, to whom we owe a great deal. You, you described uh, how much he had to learn. I, I'm curious, uh, I'm sitting near some of Washington's books. What have you come to appreciate of Washington in terms of his books and his reading? Did that help him in these early um, moments or did he have time to read? Yeah, that, that's a good question, Kevin. I'm not sure how much time he had. When he goes to Boston in 1775, he takes a stack of books. He has ordered books on field fortifications and basically how to run an army. Uh, uh, he, he is a lifelong student. There's no doubt about that. Um, my belief is, my, my hunch, is that he's learning more on the job 
uh, in the field than he is from books. Certainly there are things that he picks up and there's a lot of technical issues when you're running an army, when you're, when you're building field fortifications, when you're thinking about a siege, when you're thinking about breaking a siege, all of these things. And he may have consulted those books at times, but certainly he's learning mostly by doing and he's learning by listening. Um, he's a very aggressive guy. Um, his um, first instinct is to lash into the enemy. Um, that's a good thing generally in your generals, uh, but it can be obviously hazardous. And uh, there are occasions when he proposes attacks against the British that are would be foolhardy. Uh, and he's talked out of it by men like Green and Knox and, and others who don't necessarily have more experience than he does, very few do in the American army at that time, uh, but they think it through and they argue it and he listens to them, he's, he's a good listener. Um, he's also very articulate. I think that's something he has in common with Eisenhower. There's rarely do you come away from his presence uncertain about what it is that he means, what it is that he wants. And he's that way when he writes too, and so is Eisenhower. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm on this journey with him now. Uh, I will be with him for some years uh, to come. There are dark moments ahead. Uh, I've left him in volume one in January 1777 when he has had the thrill of, uh, of defeating the British uh, and the Hessians at Trenton and Princeton. Uh, but there's going to be a pain ahead and there's going to be many deaths. He's responsible for ordering those young men to their deaths more than anyone in America at the time. That has to weigh on anyone's uh, conscience, on anyone's soul. Um, so that good question that you ask is something that I, I'm still wrestling with. I look forward to learning more about precisely how it is that he becomes who he becomes. That's extraordinarily interesting. And one of the things that uh, I see in your telling of these months of the war and your telling of how Washington entered into this experience and how he sh took shape over time, uh, there's a great moment. I think it's, it's uh, uh, I forget exactly the date, July 7th, 9th, uh, when the Declaration of Independence is, is ordered to be read uh, to the soldiers. And the way you describe it, Washington's orders that he puts out uh, to have this read by brigade commanders uh, actually kick off by uh, ordering the lashing of some deserters, a certain number of lashes. And you get, to, you get a sense of Washington's immediate need to, to take care of the army while he's also a part of this grander moment, this, this, this moment yeah. that's captured by the Declaration. I wonder if you could describe how you're, you're getting a sense of, of, the, of the, the other things the American Revolution is. It's not just a war, it's these other things. It's these, these bigger, almost philosophical struggles. Uh, how have you come to encounter those in your research? Yes, uh, and of course, a war is just the means toward uh, uh, an anticipated end uh, for Americans at the time. And that uh, that day in New York when Washington goes uh, uh, down to lower Manhattan and uh, listens to the reading of the American uh, the Declaration of Independence, and you're right, he has given orders early in the day. The, the business of the army goes on, and that includes uh, some, some uh, corporal punishment for ne'er-do-wells. He's doing that almost every day in one form or another. Um, for me, trying to uh, integrate the military and political aspects of that period, of the period of the American Revolution, um, it's, it's complex because it's complex. Uh, the war becomes a global war, and that's what I'm going to be writing about in the next volume when the French and then the Spanish and eventually the Dutch come into it. Uh, the fighting in America is almost secondary, at least as far as the British are concerned, because now the empire really is at risk, which is what uh, George III has feared uh, all along. Um, and trying to understand how the American ambition for going to war against the greatest empire in the world, against the greatest navy the world has ever seen, uh, how those American ambitions have changed. It goes from being uh, a sequence of grievances. Uh, we don't want to be taxed without being represented. 
Uh, we feel like you're leaning on us, that you're exploiting us, you Britons, uh, to uh, something that's a, a grander uh, and something that you know most Americans don't dare to think of when the war begins in April 1775. That is to overthrow the king as, as our monarch. Uh, and at the same time, to think of what this country, it's not a country, it's 13 colonies, what those 13 colonies can become. Can they become unified in some fashion? Can they uh, evince the, um, the trappings of a republic? Can uh, those who uh, are unlettered, who have uh, little education, who have little wealth, can they become part of, of the uh, system that helps to direct this new thing coming into being? Um, watching the Continental Congress grapple with these issues, not very well, it has to be said, uh, at various periods uh, during the revolution. Uh, watching the Continental Congress use the uh, American army and the American military as the fulcrum to try to achieve the ambitions that are expressed in the uh, Declaration of Independence, it's painful at times mm -hmm. because uh, for one thing, they don't support Washington particularly well. Uh, they're, they're not especially uh, gifted when it comes to uh, providing the, everything from the bullets and the shoes and the guns and the food that you need to run a war for years at a time. Uh, so watching that unspool, even as the larger political ambitions begin to congeal and, and, and uh, obviously will play out after uh, independence is won. Well, this has been a great conversation. I, I want to start bringing things to a close because now that you, it's, it's publicly known that you are the recipient of this year's George Washington Prize, I'm sure a lot of people want to reach out to you and congratulate you. And I want to uh, 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 allow you a chance to, uh, to answer some phone calls and, and to tell some people. Uh, but we are having this conversation as part of, of the National Book Festival. And so I, I, I'm curious to ask about your reading habits. Uh, is, is there a historian that you just can't put down? Do you have a favorite historian to read? that has helped shape you and as, as a historian and, and, and writer? Oh, well, there are a lot of them, Kevin, but, uh, and I won't give you a long list. Uh, you know, when I was writing, when I began writing about World War II, I was deeply uh, imprinted by Shelby Foote, who wrote a trilogy about the Civil War. He was a novelist turned into a historian uh, uh, by Bruce Catton, uh, who, uh, wrote two trilogies about the Civil War as an elegant writer. Uh, those two writers have influenced me. There are uh, those who are more contemporary. Uh, David McCullough, I think, is really a, an elegant uh, and prolific writer of both biography and, and history. Uh, you know, right now, I, I, I am required to read things for what I'm writing about, but I try to uh, get outside of that in, in, in some ways. I'm reading uh, Elizabeth Varon's uh, Armies of Deliverance, which is a terrific book she teaches at the University of Virginia. It's really about why the North fought in the Civil War. Uh, we, we think we know why the South fought, but why were Northerners fighting? I just finished a book uh, by my friend uh, Don Miller, who teaches at Lafayette College, Vicksburg, and it's uh, one of the best uh, battle books uh, that I've ever read, uh, obviously critically important. I've named a number of Civil War uh, uh, books, uh, mainly because, you know, I am required to read everything I can get my hands on about the American Revolution in that period. Uh, but for me, reading about, uh, reading military history and history generally uh, always informs what I'm trying to do as a writer. I study these people uh, carefully uh, to see how they execute the narrative art, among other things, uh, and how they uh, research, uh, how they pull it together. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm just deeply grateful to all of them. Well, we're grateful to you for, for this book and for the, the trilogy that it will soon be a part of. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. Congratulations. Congratulations to our seven finalists. Uh, on behalf of the Gilder Lehrman Institute, Washington College, and of course, uh, my bosses, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, uh, this a well-deserved congratulations, Rick. Thank you so much. Well, Kevin, thank you. It's, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and a privilege, and thanks, thanks for having me with you today. Thank you. Thank you to all of you out there. Uh, thank you for being a part of this uh, announcement of the winner of the George Washington Prize. Uh, thank you.